In this lecture, I plan to discuss a subject that is somewhat controversial when it comes to the history of ancient Egypt, largely because there is scholarly disagreement over its authenticity. And yet, it is a story that is central to the political issues that royal the Middle East today. And that is the subject of Joseph in Egypt. Now, admittedly, this is a subject that's a bit off the beaten track when it comes to the study of ancient Egypt, largely because it's a subject from the Old Testament, and thus is not normally discussed when studying the history of Egypt, simply because the basis of it is Hebrew religious literature, and there is no proof of its authenticity in any case. I like to consider it, however, because without regard to its religious implications, it raises some thought-provoking questions. And most of my students are at least somewhat familiar with the story in the Bible and of the Old Testament. It must be recognized that the Old Testament is largely a Bronze Age document, part of which was created around the period of time that we are studying in Egypt and has a number of interesting connections with ancient Egypt. I find it useful to consider touch points like these between subjects with which we are already familiar, even if it is not traditional material that is covered in a course on Egypt, and it raises some pertinent questions that are germane to the modern tensions in the Near East. For those that are unfamiliar with the story of Joseph in Egypt, it is a story of a young Hebrew who was sold into slavery by his brothers, but who rises to power in Egypt and is responsible for creating the conditions that ultimately resulted in the enslavement of his entire people for hundreds of years. So let's see if we can penetrate beneath the layers of religious narrative and hyperbole, as told in the Bible, to see if we can discover some evidences of truth or not. I mentioned in the lecture on hieroglyphics that Moses was a Hebrew child that had been raised in the royal court of Egypt after having been rescued from the Nile River by an Egyptian princess. And in my lecture on the pyramids, I pointed out that people often mistakenly believe that the pyramids were built by Hebrew slaves. Of course, we know that that's not correct as we learned. But both points beg the question of what were the Hebrews doing in Egypt in the first place? Well, according to the book of Genesis in the Old Testament, it all began with a young Hebrew boy by the name of Joseph, who was a dreamer. He was the eleventh of twelve sons of a man named Jacob, who later was renamed Israel, which meant one who wrestled with God and who lived in Canaan, which is modern-day Israel, with his family, servants, and followers, and was a nomadic herdsman. Joseph's brothers were jealous of him because he was a favorite of his father, and because he had dreams that indicated that he would one day rule over them. So one day they told their father that he had been killed by a lion while out tending the sheep, but instead they had sold him to a passing caravan of Midianite merchants who were on their way to trade their goods in Egypt. The merchants took Joseph with them to Egypt and sold him to a captain of the Pharaoh's guard by the name of Potiphar. Then, through a series of adventures, Joseph eventually gained a reputation in Egypt as being a very capable and honest manager and for being able to interpret dreams. Now, he eventually came to the attention of the pharaoh, when the pharaoh had strange dreams of his own that his priests could not interpret. But, turned out that Joseph could. Now, the dreams were prophetic dreams that foretold of a coming famine. Joseph advised the pharaoh to lay up stores of grain for the coming years of famine. Impressed not only with Joseph's ability to interpret these dreams, but also his wisdom and management skills, the pharaoh eventually elevated Joseph to a position of authority, second only to his own office, and put him in charge of agriculture and the granaries. Eventually the prophecy came to pass, and a seven-year famine struck the entire area, 
affecting not only Egypt but the surrounding areas as well, including Canaan. Now Egypt was able to withstand the famine because of the grain that had been stored. In fact, they had so much grain that there was actually a surplus that they began selling to surrounding famine-stricken areas. Now Joseph's family back in Canaan was starving because of the famine. And when Joseph learned of it, he invited his father to bring the entire family to Egypt to ride out the famine. So the family emigrated to Egypt and was settled in the area referred to as Goshen, which we know as the Delta. There they settled as shepherds, keepers of sheep, which was an occupation that the Egyptians considered of low status. Now, according to tradition, the Hebrew tribes that descended from the sons of Israel remained there for some 400 years or so and grew to be a numerous people that were eventually enslaved when a new pharaoh that knew not Joseph came to power and feared that the Hebrews might join with Egypt's enemies to fight against them if war ever came to Egypt again. So, this is a great story and one that has been repeated over the centuries in Jewish and Christian congregations the world over, and much represented in Christian artwork. The problem with this scenario is that, while it is famously attested to in the Old Testament, there isn't a shred of literary or physical evidence for it outside of the Bible. As a result, secular historians, and even some Bible scholars, claim that the presence of Israel in Egypt never occurred. Their contention is that the entire episode was invented over 1,000 years later during the Persian era, sometime between the 5th and the 3rd centuries, invented by Jewish priests who wanted to create a divine justification for the Jews to reclaim and occupy Palestine after their return from the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC. Thus, according to these scholars, the story of Joseph was a complete fabrication in order to justify the birth of Israel as a nation and the story of Israel's covenant with God and their occupation of Canaan. But why examine this story in a class on Egyptian art and architecture? Well, as I said earlier, I think it's important to touch on events that are intersections of history or timelines between different cultures in order to see how they might better inform us of our understanding of each culture. Also, the story of the Hebrews or Israelites in Egypt is one with which many people are at least somewhat familiar because of the popularity of stories of Moses and the Exodus as depicted by Hollywood. Also, there is a very real relevance in today's world because of the tensions and contentions and even warfare in the Middle East, most of which is a result of Israel's claim to the area of Palestine that is based on these stories. So, why is the story important? Well, first of all, ironically enough, the nation of Israel was born in Egypt. If there had been no sojourn in Egypt, then the story of Israel's beginnings was a fiction, and the history of Israel would be very different today, if there was any history at all. Also, if the story of Joseph in Egypt was a fiction, then it can be argued that Israel has no claim on Palestine today. So, let's take a look at this just in summary, so that we have a better grasp of the story. And then I'll talk about the pros and cons associated with it. So a little background. Abraham was reputedly born in about 2000 BC in Mesopotamia. Now God promised him the land of Canaan for his posterity in perpetuity. Abraham had a son, Isaac, whom he famously almost sacrificed to God until he was stopped by an angel. And Isaac eventually had a son by the name of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. Israel had 12 sons, one of whom was Joseph. Now Joseph was the 11th son of Israel's 12 sons. 
He was Israel's favorite, even so much so that Israel gave him a coat of many colors to show his favor. But Joseph was also a dreamer who dreamed that he would rule over his family one day and perhaps unwisely told his brothers this. Well, so Joseph was eventually sold by his jealous brothers to Midianite merchants while claiming to their father that he had been killed by a wild beast, and the Midianite merchants then took him into Egypt and sold him to Potiphar, a captain of the Pharaoh's guard. And so Joseph ends up being a slave in Egypt. Interesting anachronism here in this story is that Camels are referred to in several places within this story, but strangely enough, there were no camels in the Middle East in those days. Camels came along much later. Now Potiphar puts him in charge of his household after discovering Joseph's talents of being able to manage his properties and his household effectively. Eventually, Joseph will be accused by Potiphar's wife of assaulting her sexually, and Potiphar threw him into jail. In jail, he gained a reputation for being able to interpret dreams. Now, three years later, Pharaoh had dreams of his own about seven fat cows and seven lean cows, and seven fat ears of corn and seven lean ears of corn. Again, another anachronism in that there was no corn grown in Egypt in those days. Corn is a, another word that was used for grain. In any case, his priests couldn't interpret this dream. So Joseph was brought before the Pharaoh. First, he was cleaned up and shaved and brought to the Pharaoh in order to interpret these dreams. Now, the dreams turned out to be prophetic, and Joseph predicted a coming famine and then advised the Pharaoh that it would be wise to begin storing grain during the good years of harvest so that when the famine arrived, Egypt would be well provisioned. Impressed by this, Pharaoh made him second in command in Egypt as minister of agriculture and gave him his signet ring and an Egyptian wife. Now, as Pharaoh and Joseph traveled about Egypt, Pharaoh in his chariot in front, Joseph following behind in his chariot, the Bible says that the Egyptian people cried out before Joseph, bow the knee before him. Now, eventually store cities were filled with grain during the years of plenty, so that there was grain during the years of famine. Now also, Joseph bought up Egyptian land for Pharaoh in return for food. In other words, after the Egyptian families ran out of their own food, then they appealed to Joseph as minister of agriculture and a person that was in charge of the grain stores, and he would trade his grain for their land. Now, years later, still during the time of famine, Israel, back in Canaan, sent the eleven brothers of Joseph to Egypt in order to purchase grain during the famine in order to alleviate their starvation back in Canaan. Now, Joseph recognized them, even though they didn't recognize him, and eventually invited them to bring Jacob and the family to Egypt in order to wait out the famine. So that's what Jacob does. He brings the entire family, along with his followers and servants and so on, a group of 70 individuals, brought them into Egypt and was settled by Joseph in the place called Goshen, which we know to be the eastern delta area. And there they prospered for the next several centuries, something like maybe about 400 years or so. The Bible is not clear on that number. In any case, that's how the children of Israel end up in Egypt. But the question is, was the story true? So here is the strongest argument against it. There is no physical evidence, nor Egyptian records of any kind, of Joseph or of Hebrews in Egypt. Therefore, according to secular scholars, the story was a pure fabrication by Jewish priests invented during the Persian period back in the 5th century BC in order to justify Jewish claims to the area of Judah. 
Now, what are the arguments in favor of the truthfulness of the story? Well, first of all, because one of the greatest arguments is the fact that there's no physical evidence there that has been brought forth through archaeological studies, it's pertinent to take a look at the, kind of the rule of thumb for archaeological standards, and that is, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. In other words, according to this rule of thumb, just because there's no evidence that they were there, does not mean that they were not there. So while there's no archaeological or physical evidence for the Hebrews being in Egypt, there's no physical evidence for them not being there either. However, there is some interesting, compelling internal evidence when we take a look at the Bible story itself. So let's take a look at that. Now the question here to keep in mind is that if this story was fabricated, how could a Jewish priest or a Jewish scribe writing a thousand years or more after this period of time, how could he have known these particulars about ancient Egypt? First of all, Potiphar, the captain of the guard, is an authentic Egyptian name. It's based on Hebrew version of Padire. Pa means that, D is given by, and Re is the god Re. So, an individual who is basically established by Re. So, an authentic ancient Egyptian name. Another interesting point is that Joseph was shaved before meeting Pharaoh, shaved and given clean linen. Now, we know from our study so far that the Egyptians were fanatic about cleanliness. And so, before being brought before Pharaoh, Joseph was shaved, a point of historical truth. Another point, the priests were unable to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Now, why were they unable to interpret the dreams? Well, in ancient Egypt, every dream was believed to be prophetic. It was just a question of how to interpret the meaning of the dream. Now, in order for priests to be able to interpret dreams, they had books of dreams. And these books of dreams contained interpretations. So, if you dreamed about a particular thing, you took your dream to the priest, they opened up their book of dreams, and looked for that thing and its interpretation. In the case of Pharaoh, apparently the books did not contain interpretation of, of seven skinny cows, and so his dreams could not be interpreted. So again, a point of truth or veracity here. Another point is that the whole story was about seven years of famine, seven lean years. Now, in the ancient world, as we've learned, Egypt was known as a place of abundant harvests. So, why would one think that there was a period of famine that lasted for seven years? Well, actually, there is at Sahel Island in the Nile River an account inscribed of a seven-year famine. So, again, a point of factuality. Then again, the Pharaoh gave Joseph a signet ring. What's the point of a signet ring? A signet ring for the Egyptians was a mark of authority on a seal for goods. So, as a minister of agriculture, this was his outward manifestation of his authority and his ability to seal up the granaries as needed. Again, very interesting point here. And the reason that I mention this comment that as Joseph traveled around Egypt, the people hailed him with the exclamation of, Bow the knee. Now, bow the knee is the interpretation that the King James scholars applied to the word that they encountered in the Bible that was abrek. Now, abrek is the Hebrew variation of an Egyptian word for which the Hebrews didn't have any direct translation. And so the term in Hebrew was abrek. When the King James scholars came to that word, they translated it as bow the knee. In reality, it is a Hebrew variation on an Egyptian word. And that Egyptian word is ib, which means heart, re, 
which in this case means to, and k, which means you. So put together, ibrek or abrek, as the Hebrews wrote it, meant, may your heart or wisdom go with you. What was this? It was a salutation of respect for an Egyptian official. So again, a point of factuality in the story, and one that even the Hebrews didn't really understand. And then also, the priests were exempt when Joseph bought up all the land in the name of Pharaoh. Now what's significant about that? Well, the thing that's significant about Joseph not buying the land of the priests is that earlier on, the priests had been traditionally given land by the Pharaoh. So the land that the priests owned was given them in perpetuity by the Pharaoh himself. So therefore, when Joseph was buying up all the land, he didn't buy the priest's land because he didn't have any right to do that. And then finally, after Jacob or Israel died, he was, according to the account, mummified in the Egyptian fashion. And it says specifically that there were 40 days of embalming and 70 days of mourning. Now, this is another one of those factual elements that whoever wrote this account got right. So, in conclusion, whoever wrote the account was intimately familiar with ancient Egyptian history and culture. And the question is, would a Jewish scribe living a thousand or more years after these events have been familiar enough with ancient Egyptian history to be able to get those things right? So, there's no proof, obviously, one way or the other, either for or against the Hebrews being in Egypt. You have to arrive at your own conclusion in terms of the factuality of the story. It is interesting to note, though, that these events were referred to later on in Hebrew literature in the Bible. These events were referred to more often than anything else in the Bible. So perhaps it says something about just the persistence of these tales. Would they have been that persistent if they had not had some basis in reality. So, thank you.